is so much speculation purporting to be scholarly in the media and in the popular imagination of Americans and other Western people concerning the exact relationship between Jesus of Nazareth and Mary of Magdala. Were they married? Did they have any children? And did the church cover any or all of this up? Many times, such American speculation that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene gets presented as historical fact that cannot be doubted. So I thought it might be good to actually test this presumption and see if it holds up to reason, as well as to explore what we can exactly know about the historical Jesus. Taking a cue from the context group of biblical scholars, I should stress right off the bat that Jesus is a first century Mediterranean Middle Eastern male. He's not an American. Therefore, during his earthly life, he wouldn't think and act and talk like an American individualist. When imagining or talking about Jesus, many American Christians, Catholics included, tend to exaggerate Jesus in a docetic way. That means to think of Jesus as God disguised as a human being. On the very rare occasion that U.S. Christians, American Catholics included, do think of Jesus as being truly human, unfortunately they tend to imagine him as a United States person, congenial to American cultural values. No United States person, of course, helped in the production and composition of the Gospels or any part of the Bible. And if we ever were to discover any American values in the Bible or the Gospels, it would be bizarre. If we were to ever find our American lives reflected in this Middle Eastern Mediterranean library, it would also be bizarre. The United States bishops explained this to us in their 1987 statement, namely that we are not to seek in this library all of the direct answers for living. Why? Because they can't be found there. It could be shocking for many United States Christians to really understand that Jesus is not an American. If Jesus begins to look and act like an American to you, something is really off. If you think you can understand Jesus, but have difficulty understanding these men, frankly, I would be quite surprised. Because all of these men come from the same part of the world where culture has not significantly changed for 4,000 years. Cultural values are the same. The plausible interpretation of biblical texts and questions like, was Jesus married? And what does marriage mean in this cultural context? Must be taken from Mediterranean culture and not from American culture. So we have to grapple to understand and try to learn Mediterranean culture in order to really get at these questions. Now, this will be easier for you if you have had the blessing of living in another country, taking part in another culture. But if you haven't lived in other countries and taken part in other cultures, it may be very difficult for you. In fact, you may even find what we're going to be talking about, in some ways, very distasteful. If prior to his death, Jesus could somehow have been picked up by a time machine and dropped into a Middle Eastern village in the year 2020, and he got to interact with the people there, you know, he would be quite at home. Yeah, sure, the new inventions and technology, the motorcycles and the cars and the electricity and the airplanes and the cell phones, laptops, would scare him, shock him. But everything else would make sense to him. Everything. The way people talk, the way people behaved, everything that people do in this Middle Eastern village in the year 2020, except the modern influences in the tech, would be very familiar to Jesus. If we're going to speculate about whether or not Jesus, the Middle Eastern male, the Mena personality, Middle Eastern North African personality, was in fact married, a sound starting point to do so would be in a manner that is culturally plausible to his world. In the Middle East, both ancient and modern, marriage is the fusion of the honor of two families. The partners are not self-selecting. The individuals merely represent the families. Moreover, marriages are arranged, commonly between first cousins. Biblical marriages, Israelite males ideally married their father's brother's daughter. So you have Abraham the patriarch. With his concubine Hagar, he has a son named Ishmael. With his wife Sarah, he has Isaac. 
If you turn to Genesis chapter 24, you see how Isaac has to marry the daughter of his paternal uncle Nahor, his father's brother's daughter. Take a look at Abraham's immediate family. If you look at the list, you'll see that there aren't any girls there. But the last of Abraham's brothers, Nahor, has a son, Bethuel. He's the father of a daughter, Rebekah. Rebekah is Isaac's first cousin once removed. That's how Isaac gets his wife. He couldn't get the best possible wife, so he gets the next best possible marriage partner. First cousin, once removed. Ishmael, however, was chased out by Sarah together with his mother, Hagar the slave, if you recall. So how is he going to get his ideal wife, his father's brother's daughter? Can't do it. It's impossible. So what does he do? Well, Ishmael marries his mother's brother's daughter, his matrilateral first cousin, next best possible marriage partner. So, father's brother's daughter is the ideal, but in the Middle East always, the ideal is one thing and the real is another. What you say there is much more important what you do there. That's very much like Jesus and the parables and his ministry. The ideal marriage partner, again, in the Middle East, even from the time of the patriarchs, is father's brother's daughter, patrilateral first cousin. And if you take a look here at the genealogy of Saddam Hussein, the whole family chart, you're going to see that they are all such cousin marriages. Now, mothers in the biblical world privately arrange the marriage, usually not too long after birth. Fathers later announce it to the public. Now, let's see how we can apply this to Jesus. Who would have arranged Jesus' marriage? Remember that historically and culturally speaking, Jesus' origins were dubious, scandalous, and shameful. The people in Nazareth refer to the Mark and Jesus as son of Mary in Mark chapter 6, verses 2-3. to this is against the Middle Eastern custom of identifying a son with his father's name. Why would they identify Jesus with his mother's name? One culturally plausible reason is because they were not sure exactly who Jesus' real biological father was. Mary's pregnancy, you see, was dubious, shameful. Mark, even though he doesn't give an infancy narrative, seems to have preserved this little bit of information that everybody knew about, that the villagers all knew about, that nobody was really sure who Jesus' father was. Matthew, in chapters 1 and 2, does give us an account of Jesus' origins in infancy, and it's a Mediterranean tale of terror. The author of Matthew has to go to great lengths to calm down his Mediterranean audience as he relates Mary's discovered pregnancy and Jesus' shameful origins. Mary, a Middle Eastern woman, was found to be pregnant before being with her husband. Think about the horror of that for a moment, folks. And even in the fourth gospel, the text we call John, we have an interesting exchange in chapter 8 between Jesus and Judeans concerning the topic of, Who's your daddy? And the Johannine Jesus is like, you know, you all can't be Abraham's sons because you don't do the things Abraham did. You see what Jesus is doing there? He's calling these people bastards. Jesus was a master of the insult, folks. And then at the top of their lungs with spit flying and arms flailing, you know, the common way people argue and fight in the Middle East, up close, six to eight inches from the person's face, breathing their breath, smelling their sweat, Jesus' interlocutors retort, we're not bastards. We have one father, the God of Israel. And then they continue and say, look, you're calling us bastards? Hey, Nazarene, we know about your origins. Why are you telling us that we're illegitimate? Come on, we know something about you. So short and sweet, it was common knowledge that Jesus' origins were dubious, scandalous, and shameful. And people who hated Jesus brought it up to him all the time. The gossip network had spread it everywhere. People were speculating. Was he a bastard? Was he illegitimate? Who was his father, really? Taking this dishonorable status into consideration, I want you to ask yourself, what women in Mary's village, Nazareth, would desire to arrange with her a marriage for her son of dubious and dishonorable origins? How would that bring any honor to their families? What would be the advantage to each family in establishing such a union? Again, how would it increase their honor rating? 
If Jesus' origins were dubious, what would another family gain by joining to Jesus' family? Beyond this, we have multiple attestation that Jesus appears to have committed Middle Eastern social suicide. At some point, Jesus seems to have moved away from his home and kinship network in Nazareth, really the only place in which he could have ever found a wife, to join John the Baptist's coalition. Folks, to do something like this would have been considered social deviancy. But then again, what do you expect from a village bastard? I'm not saying that, but I'm telling you what his peers back in Nazareth would have thought. After John the Baptist died, Jesus then formed his own political task group or coalition, the Jesus Movement. And for a while at least he was living in the household of Peter's father, Jonah, in Capernaum. A question, how would Jesus marry someone living as he was outside his kinship network? Consider, not only are traditional Middle Eastern marriages patrilateral, but they are also patrilocal. The married couple lives with or extremely proximate to the husband's father, the patriarch, patra local. It's very different than American marriages, which tend to be neo-local. Both the girl and the boy get married, and they move to a new residence, patra locally. This means the makeup of villages in the Middle Eastern world of the Bible will all be cousins, first, second, or third. Since your patrilateral first cousin resides with you in the same village, and so too does the next best marriage partner, and the next best partner after that, why would you travel as a social deviant far off to another village to get a wife? Why would Jesus of Nazareth go all the way over to Magdala to get his wife? That doesn't make any sense. It does make sense if Jesus were imagined as a Western individualist. It would make perfect sense. We live in a world of planes, trains, automobiles, and internet. We meet people far away, not our cousins. That's disgusting to us. Sounds like incest. No, we marry people completely unrelated to us, completely from different cultures, different walks of life, that sometimes live a thousand miles away from us. Such romantic, self-selecting individualists get engaged to the partner of their choosing. Engagement takes place between self-selected partners. But in the Bible, there are no individualists, and marriages are arranged. No one is engaged in the Bible. Betrothal is the right word. A betrothal always arranged by the parents. Jesus is Middle Eastern folks, not American or some other post-industrial Western romantic personality. Considering carefully all of these things, don't you think that on cultural grounds, it is probable that Jesus was not married? Now, consider for a moment, if Joseph, wait a minute, that's, that's wrong. That's a fiction. That's not St. Joseph. That, okay, that's better. Yeah, that's, just, that's the Middle Eastern disciplinarian. Right. There we go. Now it's better. Okay. Consider, if Joseph died early, as it appears he did, Jesus, as oldest son, would be obliged to take care of his mother. Okay, well, or maybe James did that, or Joseph, or Jude, or Simon. Hmm. Were these children from Joseph's first marriage? Did Joseph have a first marriage? Catholics are very limited on their options, on how they interpret these figures in the Gospels referred to as Jesus' brothers. But whatever the case, it is not clear on how well Jesus himself provided for Mary. But imagine that Jesus were married. How would he take care of his own wife and family with no connection to his own family of origin and village? People living today exposed to American culture are inclined to romanticize things with Jesus and see him as an American. A Bible scholar friend of mine, the late Dr. John Pilch, toward the end of his teaching days, asked his university students each semester, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code? All the hands would go up. And then Dr. Pilch would ask, how many of you have ever read the Bible? Most of the time, no hands would pop up, and the few that did, well, tended to be fundamentalists. I think it's very important that we do not think of Jesus as someone asexual or even anti-sexual. Thank you, kitsch religious art. To do so does a tremendous insult to human sexuality, a creation of God. 
but it also undermines the Incarnation and our soteriology. If there is something of our humanity not assumed by the Incarnation, the Fathers of the Church agree, then it is not redeemed, and we are not redeemed. We Christians believe, or at least profess to believe, that Jesus is fully human. That means he had sexual desires, folks, and understood the sexual struggle in a human way, albeit in a culturally specific human way. Now, it is not unreasonable thinking about these things to accept that Jesus subordinated the genital expression of his human sexuality as he went out proclaiming theocracy, the kingdom of God. Of course, when it comes to the possibility of him getting married, we should not imagine Jesus to be like a first century equivalent of a 21st century Western Catholic seminarian who chooses not to get married. As far as getting married or staying single was concerned, folks, Jesus had no choice at all. That he had no choice was due to no one arranging his marriage, and not some higher calling he chose to participate in. Another issue we must face is the shamefulness of this situation. Because if there was anything like our theologically developed idea of sin in first century Israel, it was celibacy. Following the insights of the late theologian Father Richard McBride, I can think of three arguments contra to the suggestion that Jesus was married. The first reason is that the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we could add to that the early pre-Gnostic form of Thomas, Q, M, and L, all are silent about Jesus being married. The second argument would be that the earliest New Testament groups, even the widower Paul, have a clear bias against conjugal relations due to their ardent expectation and the imminent arrival of the theocracy. You have to think, folks, that when the kingdom of God was to be established, and they thought it was going to be established tomorrow or the next day, it would cause cosmic upheaval, cosmic warfare. And you have to remember that Mediterranean weddings were planned and worked on for months, and they were big productions that lasted weeks. Do you throw a wedding in the middle of a cosmic war? Doesn't make sense. But one can suppose that if Jesus had been married, then such a bias would have been checked. The third argument is about Paul. Paul invokes his right to marry a believing woman, as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Kephas. Okay, so why not drive your point to home base, Paul, by appealing to Jesus' own marriage to support your argument? If the master was married, then that's the best argument to bring up why you could get married if you want to, unless you can't do that because the historical Jesus was not married. It's important that American individualists understand that Jesus was not an American individualist. He was not a postmodern. Jesus was not a romantic. In fact, no one in the first century Roman Mediterranean world was romantic. Keep in mind that the weakest emotional bond in the Middle East is that between husband and wife. The reason the marriages are arranged. Certainly, though, there was a much closer emotional bond than that between spouses, between Mary Magdalene and Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the strongest emotional bond in the Middle East is that between mother and firstborn son. This is rivaled only by the bond between brother and sister. Therefore, taking for granted that Mary and Jesus were close, they probably saw themselves as Middle Eastern brother and sister. 